Hello, my name is Mark Brannan. I'm the EMS Program Director here at Calhoun College. Today I'm going to give you a brief lecture on ele electrocardiographic monitoring. Uh, we're going to look at how to interpret EKGs, what are the parts of an EKG, and how that relates back to the anatomy and physiology that you already know. Well, before we get too deep into it, we really need to think about uh, what is a EKG. Uh, you might hear the term ECG or EKG, both are acceptable terms. An ECG is an electrocardiographic um, recording of the heart's electrical activity. Uh, there again, the term EKG is also acceptable. That comes from the German use of the word. Uh, the ECG tells you nothing about uh, the heart's pumping ability, uh, which you must evaluate by pulse and blood pressure. It is truly just of electrical conduction through the heart. As a matter of fact, there might be times when you actually have a, an electrical pulse generated that a monitor would pick up, but nothing's done mechanically. Uh, and we call that situation a pulseless arrest uh, or a pulseless electrical activity, a situation in which a, a patient has something that might look organized and normal on your equipment, but yet the physical findings aren't there. You have no mechanical pumping. Uh, we have a saying in medicine to treat your patient, uh, not your monitor. So you must understand that it's not a full diagnostic tool. It's only one snapshot in time. The body acts as a giant conductor of electricity. The, the human body is a conductor. Uh, the heart, you need to think of it in terms of the largest generator. Um, the largest generator of the heart because it, it conducts electricity and it generates electricity and creates an action potential which you've probably already studied. Uh, we can place electrodes on the skin to detect uh, this electrical activity in the body. And all the uh, monitor is and all the ECG recording equipment is is actually uh, the translation between the electrical activity and the vector flow of electricity as compared to uh, the actual mechanical action or the pumping action generated by the heart. Well, there's, there's three things that we need to talk about. We need to talk about the electrical impulses. Um, and this just goes back to basic monitoring techniques. If we have a, a generation of electrical flow towards the positive electrode, uh, we will have an upward deflection on our EKG. And that's what the first line says, that a, a positive impulse one moving in the positive direction towards the positive electrode actually generates an upward deflection on the EKG paper. So anything moving towards the positive is going to make our uh, oscilloscope or the actual uh, monitor screen to generate an upward spike. Now, a negative or downward deflection is when the flow of electricity is opposite uh, or away t uh, from the positive pole. And there's going to be instances, especially when uh, in the cardiac conduction system that electricity goes down those bundle branches to the Purkinje network and as they hit the Purkinje network and come back up, you're aware, we actually change direction a little bit. Most people are confused and think the heart kind of beats from, from top down when in reality it's a top down, bottom up stroke. Top down, bottom up. And the reason being because blood exits the ventricles in almost an upward direction. So there's going to be times which electrical flow will change. Thus, if you look at your classic ECG recording, there are times that you have negative or downward deflections on the paper. Now, the isoelectric line is the line where there is an absence of deflection, or we call our baseline, where there is no deflection, positive nor negative, going through, uh, through either direction of the pole. So the baseline, and we're going to, I'm going to show you some images in a little bit. Well, when we go into a little bit more detail with this ECG, let's talk about leads and evaluation of these leads. Now, this little fella you see here in the figure is demonstrating a, uh, something called Eisenhoven's triad. Now, Eisenhoven's triad is the basic principle of reading an ECG. I can get my marker working here. We're going to draw on this for just a bit. And you can see that the Eisenhoven's triad has some very important things. You have these poles up here, which you can see are negative. These down here, which are positive. Now, when we're talking about reading EKGs, remember the previous slide. 
vector flow or electrical flow towards the positive created an upward deflection. So if it's down here towards the positive, our deflection is upward. Now if vector flow is toward the negative lead, it is a downward um, movement of our oscilloscope, movement of our ECG tracing. Now in Eichenhoven's triad, as you can see here, uh, Eichenhoven's triad actually um, is pretty useful when we look at the heart. Now the heart doesn't just sit upright in the chest cavity like we see here in this image. The heart actually sits at about a 59 degree angle. So the heart is tilted this direction. Well, if we know anything about triangles, we know that this angle right here is 60 degrees, correct? So if it's a 60 degree angle and the heart is tilted at 59 degrees, then this line right here pretty much is in the same line with the heart. This is called lead two. Lead two. And you see it incremented there by the Roman numeral two. Lead two is very useful uh, when we actually look at uh, reading an ECG because lead two sits at almost the same axis as the heart sits. We get very sharp deflections in lead two because if the heart sits at that 59 degree angle, lead two is monitoring uh, from the patient's right shoulder to the patient's left leg, basically, and, that, and that's what we see here by right arm to left leg, from the patient's right arm to the patient's left leg. If we, we look at it that way, lead two is sitting almost perfectly in line with how the heart lays in your chest. So therefore, lead two is going to give us our prettiest picture, should in the healthy heart give us our prettiest picture. The reason being is because electrical flow should be very sharp. It either flow parallel or parallel in the same direction or parallel in the opposite direction. So lead two is going to be our easiest and prettiest lead to read. Now you can see there are other leads. Lead one is actually reading from the right arm to the left arm. Uh, lead three is reading from the left arm to the left leg. Uh, and that's why we put multiple stickers on the patient and these sticky electrodes. But ultimately, the one that should give us the best picture is lead two. If lead one or lead three give us a better picture, there's something wrong with the heart. The heart's enlarged. It has axis deviation. Uh, and certain conditions can cause this. Uh, the right ventricle could be enlarged uh, because of a respiratory problem such as emphysema, congestive heart failure. The left ventricle could be enlarged because of uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, chronic hypertension. So there again, I can get a little bit of diagnostic information more than just electrical activity. But for the sake of our argument today, we're only going to look at lead two. Uh, I do want you to realize there are other leads. There are augmented virtual leads. Uh, we call ABR, ABL, and ABF. Uh, these augmented leads, and, and I'll kind of draw them out here for you. So ABR is a computer-generated lead that's going to read in this axis. Uh, ABL is going to read in this axis. ABF, the foot, is going to read in that axis. There again, none of those should give me as pretty a picture as lead two does. The precordial leads are only used in 12-lead uh, diagnostic uh, images. So the standard uh, EKG, ECG reading will not have the precordial leads. But if you imagine Eichenhoven's triad as a hula hoop going this way, and we're, like, we're actually doing the, uh, this axis here, all right, uh, of electrical flow, the precordial leads would be me holding a hula hoop this direction so that it's reading axis of electrical flow outward. There again, much deeper lecture than our purpose is today. For our purposes today, we are going to talk about lead two, which should be the prettiest lead. Now, and the reason if that comes up in a question is because the axis that it, the heart sits in the body, 59 degree tilt, this is a 60 degree angle, right? This is 60 degree angle here. Therefore, it should have the sharpest electrical flow. All right, moving on. Uh, what information can we get from a single lead? Remember the lead we're focusing on being lead two. Well, you can get the rate of the heart, the regularity of the heart, and the time to conduction of an impulse. That's about what an EKG tells me. It will tell me the rate, the regularity, and the time to conduction of an impulse. Now, there are a few more things. Like I said, there are a few more diagnostic tricks you would learn 
uh, deeper into school, be it nursing or, or paramedic school. What can a single lead not show you? Uh, it cannot show you a presence of an infarct. So infarct would be a heart attack or dying tissue. One single lead cannot show me that. But if I use multiple leads, I can pinpoint the area of the heart that's actually dying because I'll have changes to my ECG. I can see axis deviation or chamber enlargement. There again, we talk about those multiple 12 lead EKGs because I can get multiple leads that kind of give me a more diagnostic picture. Right to left differences in conduction, uh, nor does it give me quality or presence of pumping action. Remember, what were my ways to get quality and condition of pumping action? Blood pressure and pulse rate. All right, so the EKG is an electrical interpretation of what the heart's doing. It's one of our tools in our arsenal. Well, for a second, let's look here at the ECG paper and, and how the paper is incremented. It, incremented. it is standardized. Uh, basically, when we look at the ECG paper, it gives us uh, two aspects to look at. We look at an X and Y axis here. Uh, my X axis would be time and then my y-axis is going to be my voltage and actually given in millivolts. Alright, so my millivolts is going to be up on my y-axis and then my time is going to be on my x-axis of my ECG. The speed of the standard paper, uh, a standard speed of 25 uh, millimeters per second is how fast the standard monitor runs paper through. Uh, and the amplitude, or the, uh, how high the waveform gets, shows me how many millivolts. And so when we talk about EK, uh, EKG and ECG paper, uh, we talk in terms of large boxes and small boxes. And that's just the way we kind of operate. But any small box that you see in the ECG paper, so every one of these small boxes is 0 uh, 0.04 seconds. Every large box you see on the paper is 0 0.2 seconds. So let's do a little math. How many large boxes are going to pass every second? Well, think about it. 0 0.2 per large box. We need 5, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 5 boxes should pass every second. Correct? Well, is that going to help me calculate the rate of the heart, how fast my heart's beating. We know the adult heart should be in the 60 to 100 beats per minute range. So now I have a little bit more information for calculating heart rate just based off my paper. Also the amplitude or how high the deflection is or how low the deflection is tells me about flow uh, of electrical current. But remember, electrical flow is going to be easier read in lead two because it's along that same axis of the heart. You should know this because you've already had the lecture uh, talking about uh, relating the anatomy and physiology of the cardiac conduction system uh, to the ECG, but let's look at it from a little bit different point of view. The components of the ECG, and we kind of see them down here at the bottom of our screen, they're kind of standardized. Let me collapse this one. Um, they're standardized. You can see here that we normally have this single complex, and this single complex is one beat of the heart there's one beat of the heart going on here. So let's look at the parts. We have the P wave. We have the P wave. We have the QRS complex. And then we have the T wave. So again, we have P, QRS, and T. Well, this P wave is depolarization of the atria or contraction of the atria. Now, remember, that's a top-down process. So that top-down process, if it's lead to, should generate a positive deflection. But the atria are very small, and the flow of electricity is going to be a little bit oblique to this 59-degree angle. So I don't get a very large depolarization. I don't get this large spike because the atria are so small compared to the ventricles. This QRS complex that we see here is actually ventricular depolarization. Now think about this. Notice there are some up and downward deflections of this. We send electricity down the septum through the bundle of his, down through um, 
the right and left bundle branches to the Purkinje network or Purkinje fibers, and then the electricity deflects back upwards. So we actually have this up-down deflection because at a given point in time, electricity is actually running opposite to the way it was initially. It was almost it almost did a U-turn and came back and came back up. This is why we get this both positive and negative deflection. This is a very powerful uh, contraction compared to the atria. So the millivolts are going to be much higher. And then lastly, the T wave represents my ventricles repolarizing or getting ready to do it again. Well, ask yourself, where is atrial repolarization? Because the atria had to repolarize, and the answer to that is simple. The answer to that is it's lost in the ventricular depolarization. Ventricular depolarization is so uh, massive compared to atrial depolarization that we actually lose a piece of this uh, pie when we actually don't see it because the, the gravity or the, uh, in, in comparison, the enormity of the ventricular depolarization as compared to atrial. So the PQRST is normal. And to be more precise about this, we can actually erase this and we can actually call it uh, QRS because that's what they actually uh, are related to. Well, let's walk through a single normal, keyword, normal sinus rhythm. Sinus meaning we regenerated from the sinus, the sinoatrial or the SA nu. So here we have an isoelectric line. We have a flat line. There's no electrical impulse being generated. No electricity, flat line. We look up here, we can see our SA node. As that SA node gets ready to fire, it releases a small impulse. Now notice that the SA node is my pacemaker, but I have a gatekeeper. The AB node is the gatekeeper, the atrioventricular node. So as this is generated, and I'm looking at the flow of electricity, it's kind of spread out and kind of broad, and it goes around and it has to come back to the AV node. This is why I get this little deflection. It's a very small contraction, remember. As we move on, and we move on to our next slide here, We actually start to see more of the atria start to contract, and we see it's, uh, our, gen our impulse being generated from the SA node, and it's spreading throughout the atria. So we have this single downward contraction of the atria, and this electrical impulse is being gathered back at the AV node. Still not there yet, still no ventricular contraction, so we only have the P wave generated. Finally, when it completes the uh, conduction of the atria, the atria is completely depolarized or contracted. The impulse is gathered back at the gatekeeper or the AV node, and we have a pause. All right, because remember, we don't want the atrial the ventricles to contract at the same time because uh, from the physiology side, we still have a flow of blood, right? So we gotta get blood from one chamber to the next. So we have a delay at the gatekeeper at this AV junction, and we move down to the next part of it and we actually have um, electrical impulse moving through the ventricles. Now, as you can see here in our diagram, it's moved past the gatekeeper into the ventricles and it generates this QRS complex, all right, which is very massive because now the ventricles are contracted but the atria is relaxed. It has repolarized. But remember, that uh, ECG tracing is lost because in comparison to electrical output, it's much less than the ventricles. So the ventricles have contracted and we get our QRS because we have a flow of electricity um, that has changed direction. And we talk about this flow of electricity that's changed direction, we can kind of look at it in these terms. We have electrical flow from the AV, it goes through the bundle of hits all the way down these bundle branches, but when they hit the bottom, what do they do? They flip directions. Well. Think about it. In Eisenhoven's triad, if this is lead two, this is negative, this is positive, my electrical flow is going this way most of the time, but then when it hit the bottom of the Purkinje network, what did it do? It flipped back up. And this is why we have this upward and then downward deflection. 
Because remember, a downward deflection move means we're moving opposite of the way we're reading. So that's why we have this up-down stroke. Then we finish out um, with a ventricular repolarization, which is our T wave that you see here. So the T wave appears back, the ventricles relax. But at the same time these ventricles are relaxed, what are the atria preparing to do? The atria are preparing to fire. So in a normal resting adult heart, how many times a minute should we see this T, Q, R, S, T complex? We should see that 60 to 100 times a minute. And it should happen over and over. When you reach these action potentials, we fire. Just a little bit on timing, uh, and we're not going to go too great at detail with this, but remember we talked about the small boxes meaning so much time and the large boxes meaning so much time. We can see here in this normal tracing, remember this again, the term normal, we have the PQRST complex, and this PQRST is spread out over a, a normal length of time. So you see here that it's this one complex is what? A and we have two large boxes, remember each large box is 0.2, so we have 0.4 seconds for that one complex to contract, which is about normal. Well, let's look at a few ECG recordings and just let's diagnose them and go through them to see uh, what is meant by these names. Well, the first one is completely normal, so it's a normal sinus rhythm. What does that mean? Well, that means it's normal because the pacemaker is the SA node. I have no false pacemakers. It's normal because my rate is in the rest, the, the normal rate for the adult is 60 to 100. And if I look at complexes, I have a P, I have a, a QRS, there's my P, QRS, and T. And I have that over and over. And, and the rate of this one is actually, we could do the math if you wanted to average out boxes, but the rate of this one right here it is in the 60 to 100 range. So it's completely normal. Notice, things to look at when we're looking at these four normalcy. Do I have P waves for every complex? Do I have normal looking QRSs? And do I have T waves? Are they all upright like they're supposed to be? Let's look at a uh, few dysrhythmias. Uh, and by dysrhythmia, that's uh, a rhythm that's not normal. Uh, the first one of the words you should know, bradycardia. Well, sinus bradycardia means that pulse impulse is still generated from the SA node. So the SA node is still my pacemaker. The only problem is my SA node is only firing, uh, it's firing less than 60 beats a minute. So it could be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever. Less than 60 beats per minute makes me sinus bradycardia. How do I know it's sinus? Well, you have to look at each individual complex. Do my complexes have P waves? Yes. Do my complexes have normal QRSs? Yes. Do my complexes have T waves? Yes. So it has to be sinus. But my problem is my rate is less than 60. Therefore, I'm a sinus bradycardia, or oftentimes we just say sinus brady. Key here is my pacemaker is still the SA node. I have one pacemaker. Well, how would I know if I had multiple pacemakers? Well, each of these P waves would look different. Every P wave would be shaped different. There are situations we're going to look at in a second where if we have too many uh, atrial pacemakers, we'll go into atrial fibrillation. We'll talk about that shortly. Well, the next one we're going to look at is sinus tachycardia. Now, sinus tachycardia is actually... Sinus tachycardia is actually uh, the same as sinus bradycardia. The key to it is that we have um, the normal QRS complexes, but my rate is greater than 100. So we have our normal P, Q, R, S, T. Not the prettiest in the world, but it'll do. But my rate is what? Greater than 100. Anything over 100, 100, 110, 120, 130, and up. Still, how do I know it's sinus? Well, I have a P, I have a QRS, and I have a T wave. And if every P wave looks the same, it has to be sinus. And it is sinus tachycardia, tachycardia being over 100. 
Still, my intervals are normal, my P waves all look alike, I'm just too fast. When we talk about sinus tachycardia, we think in medicine along the lines of shocks and pain, shortness of breath. Those are three things right there that cause a sinus tachycardia. Not necessarily that it is a cardiac problem. The next thing we move into is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation. Now, atrial fibrillation is a situation you see here that looks a little bit different. Atrial fib means that I have the top of my heart fibrillating. And to fibrillate means to quiver. So my atria are quivering. They're not pumping blood effectively. Well, how does my patient still have a pulse? Well, the ventricles are still pumping normal. They're just going to pump it very irregular. That's the key here. Well, let's look at the ECG. On the ECG tracing here, I have a rhythm all the way across the bottom. Uh, but notice, there's a couple of things about AFib. Remember AFib, we can call it that, or atrial fibrillation. Uh, the biggest thing to notice is that it is irregular. It's very, very irregular. This irregularity is a telltale sign of AFib. This is a normal aging heart. It's a normal aging heart. So, how do I know it's atrial fibrillation? Well, the key way is looking at these QRS complexes that you see here. These QRS complexes that you see here, all of those complexes are thin, they're upright at first like they're supposed to be, but notice it's irregular. I have a chaotic baseline. I have my isoelectric lines messed up. It's irregular. I have no P waves associated with it. The top of my heart is quivering. It's not pumping effectively. I have more than one pacemaker controlling the generation uh, of electrical impulse from the top. Everybody's wanting to be in charge instead of my SA node. Sometimes can be controlled with medication, but sometimes they actually have to go in and do cardiac ablations where they'll go in and they'll burn uh, an SA node that's acting up so that the true SA node can take over and be regular instead of all these multiple firings. This rhythm puts the patient at risk for developing clots. And what do we know about blood clots? Well, it puts you at risk for pulmonary embolism, strokes, heart attacks, and the list goes on. The next rhythm we're going to look at is ventricular tachycardia. All right, ventricular tachycardia. We've looked at sinus tach. Remember, sinus tach still is generated by the SA node, but it's just beating too fast. It's over 100. V tach is when my pacemaker is down here in the ventricle. Down here in the ventricles, you see at the bottom. Because when the ventricles start to go wild, they go. It's pretty regular across. But notice it's wide and fat complex. This is a lethal heart dysrhythmia. A patient could be pulseless in this rhythm. This is a rhythm that we defibrillate. This rhythm right here, because the ventricles are going wild and they're pumping so fast they're not moving blood. Uh, Starling's law tells us that we, it's the law of a rubber band. We have to stretch to move blood. But if my ventricles are pumping so fast they're not moving blood, well, my blood pressure is nothing. And I might not be even generating a pulse that's so low. So by defibrillating a heart that's in ventricular tack or ventricular field we'll look at next, we actually hit the reset button, just like the reset button on a computer, so that in theory it'll start beating back in a normal, synchronized fashion. The next one we're going to look at is ventricular fibrillation. Well, we've looked at atrial fibrillation when the top of the heart quivers. Remember, I said you could survive that one, right? Still put you at risk for clots and other problems like that. But v fib is when you have multiple pacemakers at the bottom of the heart that's decided to take over. And the bottom of the heart's quivering like a bowl of jello, you know, fibrillate, quivering. This is a lethal heart rhythm. This patient is probably in cardiac arrest. This is the one uh, that we need to take care of quickly. How do we stop a fibrillating heart? We defibrillate it. And that's where we're going to send an electrical impulse through it so that it contracts just like the reset button on the computer, in theory, it'll start beating again in a normal, organized fashion. This patient, you're probably doing CPR on. This is a shockable rhythm. The next one we're going to look at is our only arrhythmia. Now, the term arrhythmia means no rhythm, and there's truly 
although the words used incorrectly sometimes, there's really only one true arrhythmia, and that is a systole. A systole is flat line. Nothing is working. The SA node, uh, even some of these nodes that are trying to be super pacemakers of the ventricle, the AV nodes not working, uh, the Kinjis aren't working, there's no electrical activity. This is a clinical sign of death. Clinical sign of death. If we don't stop that fibrillating heart, once it uses all the energy that it has stored up, it'll eventually go into a systole. A systole means it's flat line. There's no sign of life. And you can see here that's a classic of systole on there, flat line. And just for giggles, I thought we would take a look at uh, a pacemaker and how that works. Now, a pacemaker is implanted, and there's different types. It could be an atrial pacemaker or what we call an AV, atrioventricular pacemaker. And maybe the SA node's having problems, or the AV node, or which it both maybe, and the heart's weak, maybe because of heart attack or disease, and it needs a little extra help. And that's the purpose here of a pacemaker. Well, how does it look on the ECG? Well, there's a couple of things. You'll see these little spikes right here are abnormal. These spikes are abnormal that you see. I'll use the mouth. These spikes right here are abnormal. These are pacemaker spikes. So right here, this would be an atrial pacemaker. Where your P wave normally would be, you're going to get this spike. This spike is going to start the action potential. Notice it's a mechanical, battery-powered uh, spike, but yet it makes it, uh, the heart contract. Now notice, electricity is quite different when it goes to the heart artificially. My complex is very wide and very ugly. That's because I didn't generate my own electricity. I'm uh, dissipating an electrical current uh, throughout the heart. Down here, this is an AV pacemaker, atrioventricular. There's two wires implanted in the heart. One, you can see, makes the atria fire, which actually does generate a small P wave. But there's a second firing a few milliseconds afterward that causes the ventriculars, uh, the, excuse me, the ventricles to contract. So you have an AV pacemaker, atrioventricular. Anytime you put someone on the monitor and you have these very narrow, quick spikes of electricity and you see something implanted normally under their collarbone, about the, smaller than a deck of cards uh, underneath their uh, skin on either the uh, right or left side, that's a pacemaker. And the, that, their heart just needs a little bit of help beating. Well, today we've done a brief overview of how to read an EKG and the general approach. And I've shown you several different EKGs. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you.